Good evening. Welcome to tonight's program. My name is Susan Phillips, and I am the pastor of First Presbyterian Church, Springfield, Illinois. I am the 15th pastor in 190 years here in this congregation, and it is my joy tonight to get to interview two of my heroes, President Abraham Lincoln and Ms. Harriet Tubman. And it is uh, part of this congregation's history as Lincoln's church, meaning we are the place where Mary Todd Lincoln was a member and the Lincoln family attended services. And this is a congregation that today is rooted in its history and reaching out in all sorts of ways that seek to fulfill God's love and justice. It's also my joy tonight to share in this interview with Tiffany Saunders, who is a lecturer at UIS here in Springfield, She's a lecturer in sociology and anthropology and African-American studies. She specializes uh, in race, ethnicity, family, and mental health, and scholarship in teaching and learning. She has been an avid volunteer, um, but one of the things that I love most about Tiffany's work is the way in which she brings together multiple disciplines. So in the Hip Hop Express, she brings together STEM education, with arts, music, and culture, and then brings those to communities throughout central Illinois. I'm also glad to share in this event because Tiffany Saunders is my new friend, colleague, and co-conspirator. Welcome this evening, Tiffany. Thank you so much. I have the pleasure of um, providing a short, very short um, introduction to our two guests tonight. And then we will move directly into um, the questions, the reason why you, are, you have all joined us tonight. Um, President Abraham Lincoln is known as a statesman and lawyer, having served as the 16th president of the United States. He is best known for his speeches and for preserving the union after the Civil War. Welcome, President Lincoln. Oh, it's nice to meet you, ma'am. Ms. Harriet Tubman is an abolitionist and activist. She is best known for having escaped slavery and for completing approximately 13 missions on the Underground Railroad to help others escape. During the Civil War, she served as a Union Army Scout and spy. Welcome, Ms. Tubman. It's very nice to be here tonight. Thank you very much for the invitation. I was also a nurse. Yes, thank you. Um, so we will start with um, you, President Lincoln. And the first question is, do you think God had a hand in the Civil War? Well, I do remember a feller saying one time that the uh, <clears throat> if you're reading in the Bible, God is the main character in all the stories. That means he is the main character in all the stories in history as well. So he is working through history to accomplish his purposes. I was thinking at one point about how in, in great contests, both parties will say that, that they are on God's side and acting on his behalf and doing his will. And yet th there are times when these are opposite sides and opposite things cannot both be God's will. Now, it, it might be that one side is right and the other side is wrong or they could both be wrong. And God's will may be something different from either one of them. And I am almost convinced that that might be the case because God being omnipotent, he can do whatever he chooses, means that he could stop this war anytime that he wants. And also that if he chooses, he could, he could choose to let one side win at any moment. And yet the war has continued. So I believe that he is accomplishing something that perhaps neither side could see at the moment. 
Thank you. That's a hard reality when the Civil War cost our country so many lives, but also the hard reality of the cruelty of slavery and the millions of lives that were uh, wrung out, that were uh, wounded, that were oppressed for so many years and so many generations. I'm, I know that you had some profound conversations, President Lincoln, with some interesting people. And particularly, um, I'd like to ask you, you, you know, you had personal conversations with people like Elizabeth Keckley and Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass. How did those conversations change your views on slavery? I reckon you could say that it reinforced some views that I have already had. I have said on many occasions, anytime I hear a feller speaking out in favor of slavery, I get this strong desire to see it tried out on him personally. <laughs> everybody who everybody who is speaking in favor of slavery as a positive good has never themselves been a slave and Elizabeth Keckley and and uh, Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass especially have achieved great things in their lives uh, Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass especially are great orators in their own right and have swayed many people to their way of thinking. Elizabeth Keckley is not uh, so much of a public speaker, but she speaks by her work and she has been a, a great businesswoman and has accomplished great things in that. And she, in fact, she uh, helped to found a relief association for new uh, contraband slaves with uh, with her influence in the business world and and her own business as well so did did those conversations convince you that slavery was was evil that it had to end i have i have always felt that slavery is a social a, a moral and a political evil, and that it not, ought not to be tolerated. However, as president, I have taken an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution and the laws of the United States. And the laws at the time that I took office allowed slavery to exist. So there is a necessary tension between those two things. Ironically, I suppose you could say, if, if there had not been a civil war, I would have never had the possibility of issuing the Emancipation Proclamation in the first place. Because it is a military measure aimed to limit the South's ability to use the economic power of slavery to make war against the government. And we, to make clear, we do not have two governments. We have one government and we have people who are in rebellion against that duly elected government. And if we have to give up everything that, that we ran on to achieve uh, all of our positions that we have, have taken to achieve this office, if we have to give all those things up to placate these people, they say that they would they would rend our union if they can't get what they want. That means the union is gone already. How, how can we administer a, a government if we give up everything that we believe in to keep the, those folks in? So let's uh, journey back for just a little bit to your time in Springfield. So we talked, um, or you spoke just um, a few moments ago about Elizabeth Keckley and Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass. Um, who were the um, Black people that you knew in Springfield? What was your relationship 
um, to them and how did they influence you on your journey to the presidency? Well, there was a, a feller, uh, Billy Florville, who was a, a barber here in Springfield. And he, he was a, a great businessman of his, in his own right. He was uh, from Haiti, I believe. And his place was, uh, was a, a meeting place for a good many men. Uh, Mariah Vance, she was our uh, a maid and cook, a hired lady for us for, uh, I reckon, nigh on to 10 years. And she had, and uh, her her son uh, and our son Robert were good friends. And when you're with somebody for ten years, you you learn a good deal about their history. Um, also, there's a feller, William Johnson. He come he come with us from Springfield to Washington D.C. He was. He was a barber also, and he come to be my, I guess you could say my, my personal assistant or my valet like that. And I had to, I had to work on his behalf because the, the other servants who were working, who were employed in the executive mansion didn't care for him because he was uh, a good deal darker skin than they were. And, and they thought that, that that position was not right for him. And, and they, uh, I went and got him a, a job in working in the, the treasury department. That's where he was getting paid from, but he was still working for me. <laughs> and, and I, uh, I co-signed uh, for his mortgage, actually, to help him get a house. And when when I went to Gettysburg, he come with me. We we come back from Gettysburg. He and I had both contracted uh, smallpox, and he got well. I got better, but he didn't get better. And. Uh, I helped to, I, I finished paying off his mortgage for him. And also I paid to bury him too. There's a lot of loss in your life. And there's a lot of loss uh, in your time, both of you, President Lincoln, Ms. Tubman. And I'm aware that both of you ha are people of faith, but maybe in very different ways. And so I'd like to ask you sort of a general question about the significance of scripture and God in your life. And um, Ms. Tubman, would you answer that question first? Well, welcome. I'm delighted to have you join us. I'm delighted to be here as well, ma'am. Well, y'all know that I can neither read nor write so I have remembered certain scriptures and I carry them with me in my heart. The good Lord is always with me. He has always been with me on this journey. And this journey that I call freedom and getting others to freedom as well, which is the work that I did on the railroad and on the railroad it was not always easy we was chased by dogs and had patrollers looking for us and, and everything but i have always remembered this that where the good lord leads you he will not leave you and he has never left me yet. He is with me even today. So I would say that 
scripture and God, they both have played a big part in my life, a big part. It occurs to me that most of the people uh, in scripture also couldn't read it. <laughs> we have a lot in common. And in, this, in the scriptures, it says that God writes the promises on our hearts. So you are in very good company. Mr. President, would you answer the question about the significance of scripture or God in your own life? Well, it has changed as the years have gone by, as I suppose it has for many of us. I, uh, I said one time that if I could find a church with a banner over it and it says that, that the only, the only rules for membership in this church is where it says on that banner over the door of the church, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart all of thy soul, all thy mind, and all thy strength, that church I would join with all my heart. <laughs> now, of course, that sounds wonderful, but it, it might also be what you could refer to as a lawyer's dodge <laughs> because there is no such church. <laughs> uh, I, I have, I was, I received a, a Bible from a, a colored delegation of folks from Baltimore who come to, to meet me as president. And I had no idea it was coming, so I didn't have anything to say. But uh, I said, in, whenever I received it, in, in uh, all, all I can say in, in response to receiving this most beautiful gift of a Bible is that it is the best gift that God gave to man. All that we are to know here and hereafter are to be found within it. Without it, we would not know right from wrong. I have, I have not had time as president to, to read in it as much as I otherwise would, but I do carry this book with me a good bit of the time. It's called The, the Believer's Daily Treasure. And it has has in it something for every day in the week. It'll have a verse of scripture and then a, a few a few lines of, of poetry perhaps underneath it. And for today's it would be excuse me a moment. Today's is about heavenly mindedness. And it has a passage from uh, Philippians uh, 3, verse 20. Our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Beyond the bounds of time and space, look forward to that heavenly place, the saints' secure abode on faith's strong eagle pinion rise, and force your passage to the skies, strong in the strength of God. Well, I look look to this book uh, for its reassurance many a time. Thank you, Mr. President. So another um, question for both of you is how did the war change your perspective on faith? Um, and President Lincoln, would you like to go first? Well, I stated in, in my second inaugural, at my one point in there, I said, uh, both read the same Bible and pray to the same God and each side invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any man should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. But let us judge not lest 
we be judged. The prayers of both sides could not be answered. That if neither has been answered fully. What want to the world because of offenses? For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe unto that man by whom the offense cometh. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those woes which in the providence of God must needs come, but now having continued through its appointed time, he wills to remove and that he gives to both north and south this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense cometh. Shall we discern therein any departures from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God will that it continue until all the bondman's years of toil shall have been sunk and until every drop of blood drawn with the sword shall be paid by another drawn with the lash. I think I said out the other way around. Excuse me. <laughs> it's been a year or two. Until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Thank you. Um, Ms. Tubman, how did the war change your perspective of faith? Perspective means how did I look up on it? Is that what that means, perspective? Or maybe how you understood or how your, how your understanding of faith changed? My faith deepened. I looked upon the work that Father Abraham and the Union troops were doing as yet another step on the road to freedom. And much as he said there, uh, it was a blessing to my soul that he was a devoted Christian man with belief in the good Lord to do what he deemed to be right and to lead the country down a path that would lead to freedom and a better life for us all particularly for those who had been under the yoke and had been bondsmen. So my faith was deepened because of the war, because of the losses, because folks gave their lives. Giving your life for something is not something that you do just, you know, will it, will it nilly. You have to be committed to want to do something like that. So, I, I thank Father Abraham and 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 the troops for doing what they did and for working with the colored troops too to have all of that happen. So, Miss Tumman, you you mentioned the losses and the costs. And in the work that uh, we do today on what we call anti-racism, we acknowledge that, that the ideas that people have about some people counting more and some people counting less are wrong. And that those very ideas cost us. The, this war cost us terribly. Slavery cost us terribly. And there's so much loss and there's so much grief that continues to come down through the years. And so I'd like to ask both of you a question about the connections that you might make between your own experiences of grief and loss 
and your thoughts on God? Well, I I, I reckon I'll I'll take a I'll take a little piece piece of that question. You know, loss and and grief. I believe that the biggest loss that I have ever experienced is to have been separated from my family. Separated from my family. My sister was sold off. I never saw her again in life. I, 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 I don't know of any other kind of grief or loss maybe death and in a way never seeing my sister anymore my family it's equal to death because i never saw her anymore that that's the worst thing about slavery is the separation of the family the mama goes one way the papa goes another way the child might go another way <laughs> and you may never see those Folks, again, it is hard to come, to come to acceptance of that. It's, I, I don't even know if that is the word to use. It, 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 it's hard to, you, you, you can't make that right because it ain't right. Simple as that. And it hurts. It hurts. Do you think it hurts God? I'm sorry? Do you think it hurts God? Well, you know, the president there said that God is omnipresent, he's omniscient, and he's omnipotent. So, and he's in charge of it all. So, you know, it, it would be something to see a tear coming down the face of the good Lord if he was indeed a man, a person. But he is a spirit and he is within us. So. So God was with you even if your sister couldn't be? Yes. As I said earlier, where he leads you he will not leave you. And he has never left me yet. He is with me even now. Always. Thank you, Ms. Tubman. Mr. President, I know you have your own griefs and your own losses in your personal life, as well as in your uh, presidency. How did that change your sense of God? It's not easy to lose a son. We have lost two. After, after our, our son Eddie died, the Springfield paper had a little, a little poem that was published in the paper it said uh, fare thee well angel boy farewell sweet Eddie we bid thee adieu affection's wail cannot reach thee now deep though it be and true bright is the home to him now given for of such is the kingdom of heaven. That was that was then. And then at the executive mansion, Willie and, and Tad both got sick. Typhoid, we believe, perhaps. And Tad got better. 
well, they didn't get better. It's very hard to see them go. The Bible states that we mourn, but not like those who have no hope. Everybody mourns and everybody loses someone close to them. But when our faith and our trust is in the Almighty, that is accompanied by a sweet, a sweet trust that he is working all things together for our good. When you when you asked earlier about you're talking about the war. There's a place in the scriptures that says God will not suffer us to be tempted above what we are able but will with the temptation provide a way out that we may be able to bear it. I suppose that there was probably a way that we could have gotten through without a, a war. There must have been a way provided, but we didn't take it. England got rid of slavery without a war, so it shows that it could be done. And I suppose also that when we lose someone that's very close to us, there could be the temptation of despair. That God has abandoned us. But we know that that cannot be true for he himself has lost a son. Yeah. And all, whenever, whenever Willie died, it was hard because we have our moments of grief. But the whole country is losing sons. Okay. Everybody, almost every household has lost sons. And some small towns have been almost depopulated of, of young men. So, without the hope that the Almighty is working all things for our good, this terrible war could, could overwhelm us. But we do have hope. We will survive it. And we will have a future. The two of you have um, been willing to share some very deep personal losses within your family. And I'd just like to take a moment to thank you for being willing to share that pain with us and invite everyone to take a breath. There is much healing to do. Thank you for being part of it. Ms. Longers. All right. Um, Ms. Tubman, we're gonna move to um, a series of questions for you. And I know we just took that um, deep breath to, to sort of heal a little bit from um, the, the stories which you both shared. I think it's appropriate to um, to discuss this idea and notion of violence um, and how violence um, is used to oppress certain groups of people, um, because it's something that we're still contending with um, even today. So we know that violence was used to oppress those who were enslaved and to threaten those who had been freed. Ms. Tubbin, how did those understandings of violence impact um, 
you and the others that you were um, helping on the journey to freedom? Threats of violence and acts of violence are, they were present with us as we made our journey to freedom. But it was the hope that we would get to a better place where there was true freedom that kept us going. Violence is something that will make you afraid. It can make you afraid, can make you want to stop doing what you're doing, make you want to turn around. Even the, the thought of it, that something awful could happen to you. But I must say, I, with folks who traveled with me, they, uh, they might want to turn around and get scared and want to go back to master. Hmm. You know, I'm not a violent person, but I did have in my bag, hmm, I call it my friendly persuader. I, I, I never had to never had to use it on my passengers because uh, just the showing of it sometime <laughs> you know would make them want to keep on keeping on the path to, to freedom so in that way the threat of violence just further just further made my passengers want to keep on going those who traveled with me, they got to freedom, which is the ultimate goal. That was the prize. That was the prize that we kept our eyes on. Freedom was the freedom was the goal and the prize. And we I never lost sight of it. And I tried to make it so my passengers, that's who I call them, my passengers, uh, if they got a little bit uh, afraid, and they did, because I think you'd be afraid if dogs was chasing you and, and you know, you look up and there's a, a lake or a stream and you don't even know if you know how to swim. But on the other side, you might be a, you would be a little bit closer to freedom than if you stay on this side. Sometimes the good Lord will just make you do stuff that you didn't know you was even able to do. Because if you believe and if you want to be free, you got to find something within yourself to keep on going, to keep on going, keep on going. If you get tired, keep on going keep on going and eventually you'll get to the get to the prize and the prize is freedom so. i know that people called you moses mm -hmm. uh, and i also know that in scripture when the israelites made it across the red sea and were struggling to figure out what to eat and what to drink they <laughs> dreamed of going back to egypt they they were afraid of what lay ahead of them and how they were going to make it there. But the good Lord made a way for them. Absolutely. And in the midst of all that, Ms. Tubman, Moses, <laughs> you seem fearless. What is it about uh, liberation? What did, what did freedom look like or sound like for you? <laughs> what did it feel like? You know, when I took my own escape before I before I went back and got others to join me. It was such a glory 
it was like the sun just opened up and all the rays that come down, they just fell on me because it was the sweet taste of freedom. And it was so good. You know, the word says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Hey, to me, that is the same as the sweet taste of freedom. Because once you get that taste of freedom, it is so good, you want to share it. You want to share it with others. It's just like the good word, the gospel, the good news of, of, the, of Jesus Christ and his savior and his saving of us. The gospel was meant to be spread. Freedom was meant to be spread. And I thought I'd do my part to spread it. And you did well. Thank you. Ms. I, I love that um, so much. And I, I want um, to talk about um, the use of faith um, to justify slavery. So we know that faith was your path to liberation, but we also know that um, whites at the time were using slavery to justify slavery. How did that affect you? You know, folks can find whatever they want in the word to make what they want be what they want. Just as these folks can find uh, slaves obey your masters, somewhere there's going to be something else that talks about the joy and the beauty and the happiness of being free and your soul being free. You know, you can be, you can be enslaved in your body, but your spirit, your spirit can be free. And so I think that enslaved folks, the, the, the slaves, they rejoice in the thought, <laughs> you know, we might not get it here, but we're looking over there. And you just have to keep looking over there and hope and pray and work and work <laughs> to get there. I was listening to the president describe the way in which um, both sides were praying God's will and, and probably convinced that God was on their side. But of course, there's always more than two sides, right? I mean, yes, there was North and South, um, but I think about um, the spirituals and I think about uh, the meetings that black folks had that were the beginnings of black churches and the way in which you yourself learned the stories of faith and committed them to memory mm -hmm. and sang them to one another. Mm -hmm. And there's something about understanding scripture, understanding the stories of the Bible, uh, being about freedom, about liberation, liberation from slavery in Egypt, liberation from exile, liberation from sin. I know there's some strange things around here. This time traveling has some, some interesting <laughs> confounds. Uh, I hope everyone who is involved in that emergency is, is safe and well. Um, you know, the, the people who, who arrested Jesus and whipped him and killed him. I don't think, I don't think God was on their side. And I think God takes sides. And when Jesus uh, preached his first sermon, he talked about coming to free those who are oppressed and bind up the brokenhearted. And uh, I'm wondering how you see yourself as Moses and, and how you had a word of freedom for other people. Because I, I, cer I certainly did. The, the sweet taste of freedom was 
ever present once I got freedom, once I took my freedom. Uh, and I just wanted, I, I, I wanted others to have it as well. And when we would be on our journey, we, we couldn't necessarily always sing because we could be found out. We had to be very quiet. But some, but when when I was getting ready to uh, to gather up folks to go on the journey, sometimes I might say uh, we might sing about swing low sweet chariot or we might talk about wade in the water because god's gonna trouble the water though though you know sometimes i believe that when master would hear us singing those songs they would just say oh they're just singing those lovely songs little did they know they was messages because who knows it early in the morning we might be gathering somewhere and always would uh, often like to go on saturday evening you know get a whole day's uh whole day's work whole day's lead on sunday and then monday hmm where they at <laughs> You know that 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 was what one thing master always thought that we couldn't think we didn't know nothing wasn't smart i'd say you'd have to be pretty smart pretty clever if you wanted to get on the road to freedom and make it all the way to the other side so that's what i say about that thank you so much. So um, I'm I'm thinking too about um, how difficult um, making those journeys must have been, sort of over and over again. And I'm thinking about um, the need for rest and just resting, sort of more broadly. So I'm wondering if you can talk about. Um, rest and how you took moments of rest um, and talk about the role of maybe some of those safe spots that you um, might have been able to use on that journey um, on the on that journey during the Underground Railroad. Along the way, there would be folks who would give us a safe haven. Uh, we would stay in a barn or in a cellar or under a false floor of a wagon or, or, or whatever. And that would allow us, we couldn't necessarily sleep soundly because you never know what might happen. Have to sleep with one eye open and one eye closed maybe because you always had, had to be, you always had to be watching, always had to be. But you, we did have to rest, but we couldn't rest for long because we had to keep moving, keep moving, one foot in front of the other all the time, all the way to freedom. And I really like that as even a message um, for today that some of this work just takes one foot in front of the other and just keep moving until um, we reach that that level of freedom for for all people. So I really like the spirit of that message um, as it applies to sort of where we are today as well. But maybe maybe one of us can rest while the other one watches. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I'm very grateful for for uh, our time together and wondered, uh, Mr. President, do you have any closing words for us about faith and race? Well, I was just hearing what was being said about the things that you can find in the Bible, and there, there are people who will make uh, 
make whatever they find in there to suit whatever they already believe. <laughs> uh, of course, there is a place in, in there where it says that now that, that, that our Savior has come, that there there is no more Jew nor Greek or slave <laughs> or free, but we are all one in him. <laughs> and besides that, I... The folks who would who would speak about slavery as being some, a, a positive good, I've never heard him speak from the the small book of Philemon. Hmm. If he were to look that up, it's a it's about a feller who had run off as as a slave, and he's going to come back. And he he it, the letter is being written encouraging him to be accepted back because he has become a man of faith to accept him back not as a slave but as a brother hmm. i never heard anybody speaking out in favor of slavery preach a passage from philemon <laughs> it's there <laughs> we, we are we are to preach the whole counsel of god and it's there and, and they ought to do something with it and uh <laughs> I had a pastor say one time as a benediction one, one time, he, he closed it by saying, and the Lord is on our side. And I had a fellow turn to me and say, is that not so? And I said, we don't need to be concerned about that for the Lord is always on the side of the right. <laughs> we, and, we and each of us and our nation should be concerned that we are on the Lord's side, not that he is on ours. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Ms. Tubman, do you have any closing words for us about faith and race? Well, it's it, it, it's hard and all we can do is to hold on to our faith as we run this race, trying to deal with race. That's all we can do. Hold on to our faith as we run the race to try to deal with the questions of race. Thank you so much for your presence tonight. Ms. Saunders, any closing words? Um, I'm just um, really grateful for um, the, sh the connections that um, I, I feel like were made between um, the experiences of the past. Um, and I like to say it's a little bit of a thread um, that carries on to the to the present, but there's also, I think, as Ms. Tubman said, hope, hope that you know, if we keep faith and keep hope, um, that we can make continue to make strides um, in this in this race to deal with race. Um, so I'm encouraged by the progress that we made, but also know that there's a lot more work to be done. And I am um, both honored and humbled to be a part of that work. And feel in this um, event tonight is part of that work. Um, and just thinking about the fact that we can all contribute to this work in different ways, that we're all called to this work um, in different ways, but that it's, really is all of our work to do. So it's not about any one person or one group. It's all of our work to do um, to continue to build towards a more perfect union, whatever that looks like. Thank you, Tiffany Saunders. Thank you, Ms. Harriet Tubman. Thank you, President Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I am reminded that uh, in Genesis, humanity is made in God's image. Every one of us, all of us are made in God's image. And so when we look at one another, we look on the face of God. And the ways in which we fail to do so, we've missed an opportunity to draw close to what is holy and what is good. We, all these decades later, still have work to do and I'm grateful for the companions on the way. Thank you to um, Looking for Lincoln for uh, hosting this event tonight. Thank you to uh, the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Museum and Library for helping us with research. 
Uh, thank you to First Presbyterian Church for giving us the time and space to do this. May we learn and grow. May we dismantle the racism in our own hearts and souls and in our society. And may we learn God's ways of love and justice today and always. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Blessings. <laughs>